Hi there, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me for this webinar on mastering your qualitative methodology. My name is Rachel. I am a senior qualitative research mentor here at Statistics Solutions. We are a full service dissertation consulting company, and we're really here to help you at any stage of the research process. So whether that is getting your topic developed, narrowed down at the very beginning, you know, as you're sort of starting to think through ideas about your dissertation all the way to the end to that, you know, final um, slide deck for your dissertation defense and everything in between. So this webinar today is specific to qualitative research. We do have a variety of other webinars. Um, including related to quantitative research, um, related to literature review, related to discussion, um, all of that. So you can find a ton of amazing complimentary resources on our website at statisticsolutions.com. Um, we also offer a complimentary consultation for us to get to know you and your research a little bit better um, and see how we can help out with your own dissertation process. And so you can schedule that by emailing us at info at statisticsolutions.com. You can also use this link um, to self-schedule. Uh, it'll just take you right to a calendar where you can find the time that is most convenient to you that's available and get that scheduled. You'll see this contact information provided throughout the rest of the webinar as well. we'll return to it at the end. Also, also note that you will get a copy of the slide deck tomorrow and a copy of the webinar um, as well. So if you come in late or miss anything, uh, that will be available to you. And I will also leave time at the end of today's webinar to answer any questions that are related to the webinar itself, the qualitative methods chapter, okay? Um, so just, just know that. If you do have questions, um, go ahead and type those into the question and answer box. Okay, um, so that I can see your question and I can get that answered at the end of the webinar. So again, this is the Mastering Your Qualitative Methodology webinar. I also have Brittany kind of running things in the background, helping me out in case of any technical difficulty, which we certainly don't anticipate, but if there is, um, she will be there to help me get things going again. Um, and if you have questions related to what we do here at Statistics Solutions, she's available as well. So again, I'm Rachel, I'm Senior Qualitative Research Mentor here at Statistics Solutions. This is Mastering Your Qualitative Methodology. So this slide um, presents both an overview of what we will cover in today's webinar as well as an overview of what should go into your methods chapter. Okay, so I uh, try to remember to use methods chapter, but if I refer to a chapter three, assuming a more traditional five chapter dissertation, chapter three is usually the methods chapter and sometimes I will slip up. I apologize in advance if I do that, um, but just so that you are aware, we're talking about the methods chapter, okay? So this is, a list of those sections that should go into the methods chapter. And this is what I have compi um, compiled over years of doing this work, uh, working with graduate students, the sections that I see most often required of them by their schools, by their departments, by their chairs. So if you are sort of struggling with the, you know, what should I put into this chapter? These are going to be your main headings. Okay, the one thing that I do want to mention, however, is if your department or your chair or your, you know, graduate school um, requires something different, if they have their own template or checklist, you want to defer to that. Okay, um, what I will present here will get you very, very far in your methods chapter, but you always want to defer to what your school wants to see. Okay, so in general, what this will look like is an introduction chapter, a cha or I'm sorry, an introduction section, a section on research design, including your rationale, your justification for that design, uh, your role as the researcher, um, 
some information on methodology, that detailed description of uh, the methodology, sort of the, the recipe for what you plan to do in your study, um, issues of trustworthiness, and a summary section. So again, I will touch on each of these in today's webinar. Um, if there are questions that are specific to qualitative methods and design, um, go ahead and pop those into the question and answer spot on Zoom so that I can get to those at the end of the webinar today. So your introduction section is going to look very similar to the introduction to most of your other chapters. Okay, what I want to point out that is uh, specific to your methods chapter is that you will preview each major section of the chapter. Okay, so like you would for your literature review, like you would for your introduction, you'll do that. And it'll be specific to this chapter. So this chapter is about your methods and your methodology, your research design and all of that. The other thing that is good to remember is that when you state the purpose of your study, which you probably will do in several places in your dissertation, you want to do this verbatim. Okay, this is not the place to get um, fun and uh, colorful with language. If you have your purpose statement written down in your chapter one, you need to use exactly the same language everywhere else in your dissertation. So it can literally be copied and pasted. Okay, you don't want to inadvertently change the meaning at all. So your introduction introduces the chapter, restates the purpose of the study, the why you're conducting the study, and then previews each of the major sections in the chapter. Uh, no surprises here. You know, we don't leave anything um, to the end. We want to let our reader know ahead of time what we're going to cover, okay? I like to think of this as holding the reader's hand. You're always sort of looking back at what you've covered before um, and then looking to where you're going as well. So your research design section, you'll want to restate your research questions again. And again, this is a situation where like your purpose statement, it needs to be verbatim or they, if you have multiple research questions need to be verbatim. So use exactly the same language, exactly the same way, copied and pasted um, to restate your research questions. And depending on the design that you're using, um, if it's a phenomenological study, if it's a case study or something else, you want to identify and define and describe whatever that concept is that you're studying, okay? That's central to your dissertation. Um, identify the tradition, the tradition, sorry, I'm already tripping up on my words and it's only Tuesday. Um, so whether that's qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods. And so for this webinar, certainly we're assuming a qualitative tradition. And then whatever the design is that you're using, is it a case study? Is it a phenomenological study? Is it um, a generic qualitative study? And so in this section, you know, there are a couple of goals, okay, that you want to accomplish. First, you need to demonstrate that you are familiar with qualitative research in general, so broadly speaking, quantitative research, again, broadly speaking, and mixed methods research, broadly speaking, okay, and the appropriate uses of each of those, okay, because it's only after you can demonstrate that you are familiar with those approaches that you can justify why one is the best for your study, the most appropriate for your study. So demonstrate familiarity and understanding of other research traditions, and you'll do the same thing for the design. So highlight a couple of qualitative research designs that may be appropriate for your study. Okay, again, to demonstrate that you're familiar with them and the situations in which they work, in which they don't work, and then why the design that you have selected is the most appropriate. So you're building a case here that whichever design you're using is the best option 
for your study, if the most appropriate to understand, to um, address the purpose of your study and the research questions. So then the question is, why would you use a qualitative design? Okay, and again, this is a high level overview of when a qualitative design might be appropriate, okay, for this qualitative approach. So if your purpose and your research questions have something to do with understanding perspectives or experiences of participants, so sort of the why and how questions, that's a good indication that a qualitative approach might be the best fit. Okay, it's good for use with textual data. Um, and so textual data are data that we would collect through things like interviews and focus groups. So maybe a, a individual interview versus, you know, a group interview, you might use both depending on your study, a document analysis, again, the text observations. Okay. And in qualitative approaches, the goal isn't to generalize our findings necessarily, okay? Because we're, we're sampling participants who have all been through a similar experience, right? So that's maybe going to speak to others who have been through that experience, but not like the general public, okay? Not everyone. So the goal isn't necessarily to generalize. We're really trying to understand this sort of one specific concept, um, maybe what people's perspectives are on that. We're not hypothesis testing, okay? We leave that to the quantitative researchers or maybe if you're conducting a mixed method study, but we don't test hypotheses in qualitative research and we don't quantify our results either, okay? So we're really working with words. And there are different types of qualitative research designs that we can use, okay? So um, I'm going to speak to those that I see more commonly, okay? Although this certainly is not a full list of possibilities when it comes to qualitative research. So just know that there is more available and out there, um, but, you know, this is kind of just to give you an idea of what is available. So, Case studies, phenomenological studies, and generic qualitative studies are what I see most commonly in the students I work with. I also occasionally see a grounded theory or an ethnographic study, okay? Um, but certainly those are less common. So a case study then is really helpful for understanding an example of something over time um, by providing the sort of 360 degree in-depth analysis, okay? So if we're looking at something that is an atypical case or something that's an exemplary case, something that stands out as being different from other cases similar to it, that's when we might use a case study, okay? Uh, there are single case studies and multiple case studies in different types of designs. Um, within those, so I don't cover them here. Um, if you're you know, considering a case study, there's a lot of good information out there, but again, sort of at the level of um, high level overview, um, you know, a case study is looking at an example with an in-depth analysis. So let's say that you are looking at a high school math class, okay? Or a high school math curriculum. Okay, so you're in education and there's a school district. There are five high schools in the school district and all five of them have implemented this new curriculum. And four of those schools have seen improved student outcomes and one school hasn't, okay? So that might be an atypical case, right? And so we might wonder, well, what's happening in that in that school where they're not seeing improved outcomes for students based on this new curriculum. And so you might conduct a case study to better understand that. 
Okay. Um, case studies rely on multiple data collection methods. So if we're conducting our hypothetical study, we might uh, conduct interviews with teachers who are using the curriculum. We might um, interview like math coaches. We might interview administrators. We might conduct classroom observations. We might uh, analyze documents related to that curriculum because we're trying to understand the how and the why, right? What's going on in this particular in this particular context? So the idea then is that we have this rich description of the case, ultimately, you know, this in-depth analysis, and we can look at the themes that emerge from the study of either that case or multiple cases if it's a multiple case study. So um, by way of comparison, then, a phenomenological study is really helpful when we're looking at the lived experiences, what it's like to live something of participants, okay? So this is very different from a case study. It's very psychological in nature because it has to do with meaning that people assign to an experience and how they understand that experience. It is rooted very heavily in philosophy. There are philosophical underpinnings and assumptions related to phenomenological studies. And so in phenomenological studies, we use in-depth interviews. Okay, we're trying to understand what it's like to go through an experience, okay, what it's like to live it. And so we might conduct one in-depth interview that lasts for a couple of hours. We might conduct multiple in-depth interviews with the same participants that last a couple of hours each, whatever is obviously most appropriate for your own study. But the idea here is that there is some commonality to the experience. There's some sort of essence of that phenomenon, okay? Essence of what that experience is like. And so that's sort of what you're trying to get at in phenomenological studies is what is that, what is that core of the experience? Generic qualitative designs can be very, very helpful when there are um, aspects of your study, components of your study, your study doesn't quite fit with another design. So it's not maybe quite a case study, um, it's maybe not a phenomenological study. It doesn't fit squarely into one of the other designs. Um, so maybe we're more focused on the experience itself and not how people have made sense of the experience, right? Their interpretation of that or what Percy and colleagues have called this outer world content. And I, I mentioned the source because I, I find it very helpful for justifying a generic qualitative study. So make note of this if, um, if you do have questions, I realize it's now six years old, but um, generic in this context doesn't mean not as good, okay? And we tend to label it as such. And so what I have seen in working with students over the years is um, I will occasionally get pushed back from chairs, you know, who, um, who say this isn't you know, this isn't a justifiable research design, and it absolutely is. And if you need to justify it, the, the Percy article is very helpful for that. But if there are elements of your purpose, your research questions that don't quite fit within a case study or a phenomenological study, then a generic qualitative design can be really helpful. Um, so you can select from the data collection techniques that make the most sense for your study. Okay, um, mixed methods might also, mixed method studies might also, um, you know, you might use a generic qualitative design in a mixed method study. You can conduct interviews, questionnaires, surveys, and observations, document analysis. Um, there's just a lot more flexibility to this design, which makes it very, very helpful. Okay, flexibility, however, doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Okay, because everything, all of your decisions related to your design have to make sense in the context of your study. Okay, so your problem, your research questions, those are always going to drive the methods that you use. So you have to be able to justify the methods. Occasionally, I will see students 
who conduct grounded theories studies, these are very different from what we've talked about already. So grounded theory actually starts when we know little about a topic. Okay, and so instead of being guided by research questions, being guided by, um, you know, a theoretical framework, conceptual framework, something like that, um, the goal is to develop theory based on the data. So oftentimes this is not really for novice researchers because it can take so long and it really approaches it, it just approaches research in such a different way. Okay, so conduct grounded theory through interviews and field work and text and document analysis and um, you know memoing, theoretical saturation, which means that um, you sort of reach the limits of what you can know about the the concept that you're studying, and data collection and analysis work in a sort of back and forth process in conjunction with one another. And so you might know little about a topic, you might be interested in finding out. And so you find some people to interview about that topic and learn a little bit more. And you analyze those data and based on those findings, make some decisions about where to go next for interviews. Okay, so you're sort of working your way in. Um, and then ultimately at the end, you've collected your data. You've reached a point where the more people you interview, you're no longer finding uh, novel, novel results. You know, you're not learning anything new. Um, and so from there, then it's developing a model or a theory to explain those data you have collected. Then ethnography is another that I occasionally see, but again, not, um, not a whole, whole lot, but it's another qualitative design that can be really helpful for understanding a problem in the sort of broader cultural or societal context. So um, you might have a specific purpose or research questions, but the study, um, the inquiry itself is really holistic because you're placing that in the context of, um, you know, social groups or networks of people and institutions and how all of that functions together. And so ethnography, we also use interviews um, but relies heavily on extended periods of time in, in the field, conducting field work and participant observation, where we are not only observing what people are doing, but we are participating in what people are doing as well. Um, takes place, place through conversations with people. And so the, the goal then is this in-depth account of, um, you know, that research prob problem sort of from this perspective of the participants, it's almost like an insider outsider perspective um, and in the broader context of the culture and society. So um, just, you know, those were a few designs to kind of think about, uh, you know, for your own studies. Once you have the research design section of your methods chapter, you'll also include a section on your specific role as the researcher. So are you an observer? Are you a participant? Are you a participant observer? Um, you know, what is your role in the research? We are humans and we are working with humans. And so we always have some impact on our research. What's your role in it? Okay, so here you wanna describe if there are any power dynamics between you and potential participants, if there are conflicts of interest, maybe you work at the site that you want to, where you want to conduct your study, okay, and that might be okay, you might get that through your institutional review board, um, but you certainly have to outline how you will mitigate any power dynamics, any conflicts of interest, any bias that you have toward the research, okay, so it's thinking all of that through ahead of time, and then any other applicable ethical issues. Right, so as much as possible, it's anticipating what some of these issues might be as you go forward with the research. You'll include a broad section on methodology. And so within that, um, you know, and these are, the, these are the procedures, right? These are the instructions for how to conduct your research. And so within the methodology section, you'll probably have separate smaller headings and sections. So one section on your participants. 
Okay, so the overall population, right? You wanna describe what that population is. So what group of people will a sample be drawn from? Okay, so everyone who could potentially be in your study, not that everyone will be, right? That's why you sample. Um, you'll describe your sampling strategy. So purposive sampling is the most common. So it's not random, it's criteria based. Okay, so then you would want to outline what those inclusion criteria are. So what are the characteristics that people must possess to participate in your study? Okay, and then how you plan to verify that. So when people contact you, will you have just um, a brief telephone conversation with them to ensure that they meet those, those criteria? Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about that in this section? The number of participants that you are aiming for in your study. So usually that's a range, um, <clears throat> you know, and again, that's going to depend on your study, what makes the most sense for your study, and then um, looking to other research related to your topic um, and seeing what other researchers have done in terms of your, uh, in terms of sample size. So how many people you wanna recruit. You will outline the steps to identify contact and recruit your participants in this section. Um, this is not a bullet point list or a numbered list, although it can be helpful certainly to think of it like that because you really want to go in order. You know, what's the first thing that you do? What's the second thing that you do? What's the third thing that you do? So you do wanna write it in narrative form, but if it helps, initially to make it as a bullet point, um, you know, then I would say certainly do that kind of whatever helps you for your own thinking about it. Um, and then you'll also talk about the sample size, right? So again, how many, um, how many participants and how that relates to data saturation, the point at which you are no longer learning anything new about the topic as you recruit more participants. You'll include a section on instrumentation under the methodology as well. So you'll use, you'll include here all data collection instruments. It may be that you are only conducting interviews. And so you would talk about your interview protocol here, but it might be that you're conducting a case study and you're using different data collection instruments. So any instruments that you plan to use, you describe in this section. For each instrument, you wanna talk about, will you create your own? Okay, are you developing your own interview protocol? Um, is something already available that's published? Okay, and if you're using that, then you'll also want to outline that you have permission to use it, right? So are you creating your own? Did somebody already come up with this? Um, what you plan to do with that? If you're conducting any kind of document analysis or document review in this section, you'll want to describe the source, you wanna identify the source and then describe how you will verify the accuracy of those documents, okay? So here, think about demonstrating how those data sources are sufficient to address your research question or research questions. So sometimes it can be helpful to maybe create a little table of your research questions and um, align each data source to the research question. Um, you know, maybe that helps you to sort of visualize how the data will address the research question. So certainly do that if it makes sense. Okay, but you wanna really, again, you know, it's about justifying how and why those instruments are the most appropriate. For each of those instruments, then in terms of your procedures, you want to describe where you will collect data, whom you will collect data, the frequency of your data collection events and also the duration of those data collection events, how you plan to record data, and importantly, any contingency plans in case of loss to attrition. So this happens really commonly. Again, we work with people and that's okay. Um, but you know, people drop out of studies, that's fine. So if you are trying to recruit say 12 to 15 people and you've got somewhere between that number, but then a couple of people drop out and you've only got nine participants, um, what are your plans to recruit more people, right? To get within that 12 to 15 person range, okay? Um, outline any debriefing or follow-up procedures that you'll use with your participants. Um, 
So things like, will you conduct a transcript verification with participants where, you know, maybe you've conducted interviews, they have been transcribed into a Word document. Maybe you're going to send that Word document to your participants um, for them to verify the accuracy, okay? Or make any amendments that they want because that's, that's perfectly acceptable too. Um, the member checking process is once you've analyzed your data and you have kind of a summary of your findings, sending that to participants and asking them if those findings capture their experience, okay? So any of those procedures you'll also describe in the section. You'll also include a section on your data analysis plan. So for every type of data you are collecting, okay, and again, maybe you're just conducting interviews and that's fine too, um, but what you want to what you want to do is describe how those data are connected to your research. So again, how the data will address the research question and how you plan to analyze. So coding procedures for your data, there are different types of coding that are available. Um, some of these are specific to particular qualitative designs, others are not, and they're much more flexible. So whatever plan it is that you are going to follow, you'll outline what those procedures are. If you plan to use any software in your analysis, you'll also describe that in this section. There, there are several amazing qualitative software programs that are available to help researchers with analysis and really where they, where they shine is in the ability to organize the data and kind of visualize connections between the data. They don't analyze data for you. Um, so if you plan to use that software, you want to describe it and how that fits within your data analysis plan, your coding procedures. We'll describe that in this section and how you plan to handle any discrepant cases. So sometimes we have a participant who doesn't fit the pattern, right? That's emerging in our data. Um, and so what you, what you plan to do with that, how will you factor that in? You know, unfortunately, um, or maybe fortunately, you know, in qualitative data, we don't just toss out discrepant cases. Oh, well, this person is totally different. So I'm not going to think about that person anymore. That's not how it works. Um, because discrepant cases can tell us a lot about variation and can point us in new directions. So you'll describe how you plan to handle those cases if they arise in your data collection and, and analysis. You will also include a section on trustworthiness of data. So there are sort of historically these four key tenets of trustworthiness, credibility, transferability, dependability, confirmability. So making sure that our findings are accurate, okay, how confident we are in their accuracy, that our findings are perhaps applicable to other contexts, that they are consistent. So with replication, we see this, the same or similar findings. Um, and that our findings are based on what our participants say, not what we think as the researcher. Okay, um, and there are some cases that are more interpretive where um, the researcher um, and the researcher's perspectives do uh, play a bit of more of an important role here, but that's not always the case. And so there are different methods to establish trustworthiness. So in this section, what I recommend doing is outlining for each of these what they mean and how you plan in your own study to establish that. Okay. We talked a little bit about the role of the researcher um, and so touched on this, the ethical procedures related to that. Um, but there are other ethical procedures that you'll want to outline in your methods chapter. So that's a good thing to include here. And, and the other thing that I'll say too is the more detail that you can provide here, the easier your institutional review board application or IRB application is going to be because you've already thought through all of the details that the IRB will want to see, okay? So this is where you will describe any agreements that you have to gain access to your participants, to data, so site permissions, you'll also describe obtaining IRB approval from your own institution, okay? But if you are conducting 
research, say at a school or an organization, they may have their own IRB. And so it might be the case that you have to submit a second application. This is where you talk about all of that. So what, what, what your reviewers want to see is that, you know, you have these plans to conduct the research, but you also have approval from the necessary people or research sites to conduct that research as well. Um, this is where you talk about how you will treat human participants. So the ethical considerations of working with human subjects, right? So again, permissions, um, ethical considerations related to recruitment, related to data collection. And a lot of this has to do with um, maintaining the confidentiality of our participants and also of our data, okay? In qualitative research, anonymity is difficult because that would mean that we don't know who our participants are. Um, we don't have any idea about them, um, but we're, we're doing things like interviewing and talking with people. And so usually we do know who our participants are. So the best that we can do is maintain confidentiality so that nobody knows that they are a participant in our study and that nobody has access to their data, okay? Um, and that their data cannot be linked back to the participant. So outline any plans that you have to secure data from participants, um, how you plan to destroy the data after a certain period of time. This is something that your university will be able to provide guidance on. Um, you know, but in terms of security, you know, we're talking about what you'll do with a like locked and password protected computer and encrypted files and physical data that might be kept in a locked filing cabinet and you, you're the only one who has access to that. Those are, those are the kinds of details that you want to include here. Okay, so anything related to maintaining confidentiality of your participants and of their data. The final section will be a summary of the main points. So you'll recap what you've talked about and pull the reader along. Again, think about looking back and looking forward. So what the problem was, what the purpose was, what the research questions are, and then your methods and methodology that, that stem from those things, right? So think about if someone only had time to read the summary of the chapter, what would they need to know to understand your study and the methods of your study? Okay, so provide that recap, and then you want to present a transition to the next chapter. And usually that will be your results chapter. Okay, so this is setting up the, the methods that you will use to collect data. Okay, from there, you'll generally um, go on to data collection once you have IRB approval, and then the next chapter will be the results chapter. So the sections are great. Um, again, you know, if you sort of follow these guidelines, of course, deferring to whatever your institution has available for you, um, you are very well set up for writing your methods chapter. But I also work with a lot of students who spin their wheels because this can be a very challenging chapter to think through. Okay. Um, I think that's because it requires a different type of thinking and writing than a literature review. So this is, you know, if you've just written your literature review where you're analyzing and synthesizing information, this is gonna be something totally different, right? You're planning to conduct a study. You're making step-by-step -step plans, procedures for how to conduct this study. But right now it's hypothetical. You haven't conducted the study yet. So then, you know, that's where the spinning starts. What if, what if? What if, what if, what if something happens, right? Um, so you have to get over the what ifs, just get over them. What if there's a global pandemic? You know what, it happened, who cares? Everybody writing their dissertation right now is working through a global pandemic. Things will change, that is to be expected. Okay, we don't always know how or to what extent our methods will change. Be comfortable knowing that they will and you'll just be able to handle it later. Okay. Um, if you're having trouble coming up with, 
you know, some of this initial information. Think about your problem and your purpose and your research questions. Remember, everything starts there. Those drive everything. Think about what data do you need to answer your research questions. Think about who you need to talk to to find the answers to your research questions. Um, are there documents? And if so, what documents or observations will provide the answers to those research questions? Use that as a starting point, okay? You can think of this in two parts, right? The methods are the ingredients. The methodology is the instructions, okay? So if you're making chocolate chip cookies, you have to have both, right? We need to know how many chocolate chips, how much flour, how much sugar needs to go into the chocolate chip cookies. We also need to know how we combine those. What are the instructions, right, for making those? So that's the methods and the methodology. Okay, so you're providing the ingredients, but you're also providing the instructions because the instructions also don't make sense on their own. If it just says combine chocolate chips, flour, and sugar, well, we don't, we don't know how much, right? Um, be comfortable with the fact that these might change. Okay, this chapter is the expectation. It may not be the ultimate reality. Okay, so later on in your results chapter, you will have the opportunity to talk again about usually Right. Um, you'll have the opportunity again to talk about what in your study changed, why it changed, um, how that might have impacted your study, impacted your interpretation of your results, that kind of thing. Um, if it turns out that those changes presented uh, a limitation, you'll talk about that in your discussion chapter as well. And that's that's fine, too. Right. Just be comfortable with the fact that it's going to change. And I know that is easy for me to say. Um, because I'm on the other side of this now, um, but but until you're until you're collecting data, you know, just be be comfortable with a little bit of unknown, okay, and know that you can go back and change things if you need to. Okay. If you're still stuck, that's why we're here. So again, we are Statistic Solutions. We're a full service dissertation consulting company, and our entire goal and purpose of being is to help you who have perhaps been stuck on your dissertation for quite a while now, get through, okay? Um, we provide editorial support, mentorship through the entire dissertation process. So again, you can email us, you can call us, you can use the scheduling link that's in the chat to get yourself scheduled for a complimentary consultation to find out what kind of services we have that can help you. So unique to your own study, okay? We also have amazing resources available on our website. We have other webinars. We have a webinar archive, but we also have a list of upcoming webinars that you can get yourself registered for on the website. We have a blog that covers just about every possible topic related to the dissertation process um, available to you as well. So there are all kinds of goodies available, but we are really here. We know that you've been struggling. We know that you have been working on your dissertation maybe for years now. You don't have to raise your hand, right? But, you know, some of us took a little bit longer, okay? Um, and so we, we know what it's like. We've been through the process as well. So we're here to help and support if you need it. We do have time now for some questions. So again, go ahead and type those into the question and answer the Q&A box. Um, and I also had, um, let's see here, I had an email question come through the other day um, that I do want to address really, um, really quickly before we get started about mixed methods studies. Um, and the question is explaining the process of synthesize, uh, synthesis and the data analysis process. So um, let's see. So I think this participant is just looking for um, more detail to provide in terms of the actual process of synth uh, synthesis. Gosh, I'm so sorry, I can't talk. I feel like it's the end of the week and not the beginning, um, which is very embarrassing. <laughs> it's 
not, it's only Tuesday. So um, in terms of, yeah, I, the synthesis, I'm assuming you're referring to bringing the qualitative and the quantitative components together um, in the mixed method study. So, um, There are, I'm, I am blanking on um, names, but there are articles out there that talk about the points of articulation between qualitative and quantitative research um, and where they inform one another. And so I would look into that. Um, I would have to do a little bit digging and to this participant who asked the question, um, I will make a note to myself to actually do that because I know, I know where to look. I just obviously can't do it right now. I um, need to think of the name. Um, let's see. I'm just making a note to myself. But there is information about there, um, about that topic. And then also, um, but it's really, it's really outlining very, clearly the procedures that you use. So things like, um, you know, and depending on sort of the sequence of things in a mixed method study, um, you know, here are the points of articulation between the qualitative and the quantitative. And here's how, you know, those data were triangulated. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's just outlining lightning very, very clearly. Um, you know, I, I think too much detail is usually better um, in terms of our processes than not enough detail. So even if you feel like it's overwhelming, you could always scale back later, but to get all of the information in there, um, I think that <sighs> err on the side of providing too much detail, yeah. Um, I have a question also about what type of software do I advise as best? Great question. Um, my sort of funny response to that is whatever um, your school provides you, whatever is the least expensive, okay? Um, fundamentally, they do the same thing each piece of qualitative software, each type of qualitative software. They have their own little quirks. Um, and so you, you may play around with them, but most schools will give you access to one program or maybe multiple programs, um, you know, for free or at a discounted price. If that is the case, that's what I advise is best. Again, um, a lot of them have bells and whistles that most of us don't use um, in qualitative research. So I would say, first of all, whatever you can get uh, for the least cost. And then um, after that, you know, maybe play around with a couple and see what sort of makes the most sense. I've got another question about ethics. Um, so to clarify, you need to put all of the ethical procedures in your proposal as well, or just state that you will do IRB in the proposal and follow IRB protocol. No, you'll wanna put um, your procedures into your proposal as well. And again, this is something that certainly defer to um, whatever your school or department or chair wants you to do. Um, but yes, you will want to include um, the ethical procedures that you plan to use to maintain confidentiality, um, make sure that no harm comes to your participants. You'll want to include that in the, in the chapter as well. Um, I have a question about dyadic analysis, and I, I am so sorry. That is not my area of specialty at all. I don't know a whole lot about that one. I would need to do a bit of a deeper dive to get, um, to get you a good answer to that. Other questions, go ahead and pop those into the Q&A box.
Okay, it looks like um, some additional examples of what would be a generic qualitative design. Um, I'm trying to think of what some examples that I've worked on. I mean, it's really a lot of times, I'll tell you sort of working back, a lot of times what I see happen is that, you know, there's a general interest in perspectives on an experience, but there's not such a focus on sort of the psychological component. And so a lot of times where I see students sort of go astray is that if, if something says perspectives on an experience, then it's sort of assumed to be phenomenological. And that's not always the case, right? Because phenomenology does have to do with that meaning making and, and what it's like to live that experience. And so that's where I think um, a generic qualitative design can be sort of the most helpful um, is in this sort of space, right, between what's the experience, but then, and the perspectives of that, and then how do people understand that? How do they make meaning of it? What are the words that they use? What's the language that they use? Um, all of that, which goes into the you know, phenomenological, the philosophical, the psychological. It's a, it's a, it's really, if you're sort of having the this, this sense that your study doesn't quite fit, right? Um, you know, maybe a case study looks good, but you really only need to collect um, data through interviews uh, as opposed to a lot of other data collection techniques. You know, we know that case studies rely on multiple data collection techniques. And so, um, um, you know, so that might be a good generic qualitative design. So it might be that you have elements of a different design. It just doesn't fully align. It looks like a couple of questions have come through in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, one question about so if you already have a consultation scheduled or an appointment scheduled with David, he can definitely help you out with that. Um, let's see addressing the method section and a prospectus, it's really just gonna be a scaled back version of sort of what you're, what you're thinking about, what you're planning to do. So it's not gonna be fully in depth in the way that you would include um, in a full chapter. If there are any last minute questions, go ahead and pop those into the question and answer box. I don't see anything else coming through. So hopefully this was helpful for all of you. Um, you know, I've, I've been there. It's, it can be, like I said, a daunting chapter, but it's absolutely doable. Um, so take heart in that. Definitely make use of our website and all of the tools available that we have for you. And if we can help out at all, go ahead and schedule your complimentary consultation. Otherwise, thanks so much for joining me today. Happy writing. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.